let's turn in our copies of God's Word to Exodus chapter 33. Exodus chapter 33 is found on page 93 in the Bibles provided. Exodus 33. So we've, uh, we've been at the foot of the mountain. We've, uh, we've been seeing uh, this great tragedy, this great sin of the people making a golden calf, bowing down to it. Now it's true that a mediator has interceded and judged the worst offenders, but the question that lingers at this point in the story of Exodus is, what is this event as a whole going to mean for God's people, for Israel? What will this mean for all the tabernacle instructions that Moses has been diligently receiving at the top of the mountain? Will God still dwell with his people? In light of these questions, we find this passage. Uh, I'll be reading uh, even into chapter 34 a bit. Uh, This is a longer reading. Let's hear, uh, let's give our full attention as I read from God's holy and inerrant word. The Lord said to Moses, depart. Go up from here, you and the people whom you have brought up out of the land of Egypt, to the land of which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, To your offspring I will give it. I will send an angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go up among you, lest I consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. When the people heard this disastrous word, they mourned, and no one put on his ornaments. For the Lord had said to Moses, say to this, to the people of Israel, you are a stiff-necked people, for if in a single moment I should go up among you, I would consume you. So now take off your ornaments, that I may know what to do with you. Therefore the people of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments from Mount Horeb onward. Now Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, far off from the camp, and he called it the tent of meeting. And everyone who sought the Lord would go out to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. Whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people would rise up, and each would stand at his tent door and watch Moses until he had gone into the tent. When Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent. And the Lord would speak with Moses. And when all the people saw the pillar of clouds standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people would rise up and worship, each at his tent door. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses, face to face, as a man speaks to his friend. When Moses turned again into the camp, his assistant, Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, Bring up this people. But you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you also have found favor in my sight. Now, therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me now your ways, that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. And he said, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And he said to him, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not in your going with us, so that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, this very thing that you have spoken, I will do. For you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Moses said, please, show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But, he said, you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. 
The Lord said to Moses, Cut for yourself two tablets of stone like the first, and I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets which you broke. Be ready by the morning and come up in the morning to Mount Sinai and present yourself there to me on the top of the mountain. No one shall come up with you, and let no one be seen throughout all the mountain. Let no flocks or herds graze opposite that mountain. So Moses cut two tablets of stone like the first, and he rose early in the morning and went up on Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him, and took in his hand two tablets of stone. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. And Moses quickly bowed his head to the earth and worshiped. And he said, if now I have found favor in your sight, O Lord, please let the Lord go in the midst of us, of us for it is a stiff-necked people and pardon our iniquity and our sin and take us for your inheritance. And he said, behold, I am making a covenant. Before all your people, I will do marvels such as have not been created in all the earth or in any nation. All the people among you who, who are shall see the works of the Lord. For it is an awesome thing that I will do with you. So ends the reading of God's word. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are the God that you are. And so, Lord, we pray that you might show yourself to us this evening, even as bold as, as Moses was to say such things. Lord, if you will not go with us, do not send us from here. Show us your glory, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. What are things like for a husband and a wife the day after they have had a quarrel? Do things go back to normal? Do they kiss and make up? Well, of course, the answer to that question depends a lot on the circumstances. It would depend a lot on the couple. It would depend a lot on what they had quarreled about. By God's grace, many quarrels end with greater demonstrations of forgiveness and love. And the marriage becomes stronger than it ever was before. But sometimes, and I'm sure that some of us know this all too well, whether from marriage or another relationship, when one partner has so wronged the other that he or she cannot help but feel persistent distance from the other, you realize that the blame is not to be shared 50-50, Sometimes you realize you blew it. You wronged the other person. And now you wonder if they'll ever forgive you or if the distance you feel from your beloved is only going to increase. You realize how much the other person means to you because you feel the absence. Now, dear ones, the passage before us this evening is not about a marriage. It's actually about a stronger and much more important relationship. It's about God's covenant with his people. And at this point, Israel has broken faith with their God, as all have sinned and fallen short of his glory. And therefore, this passage portrays for us what our hearts should be like. But it also calls us to consider the surpassing worth of knowing God himself, of having him near by letting us experience, even through their experience, the distance that sin causes. And so what I want us to do this evening 
is to realize, to know our, for ourselves the surpassing worth of God with us. The surpassing worth of God with us. Now first in this passage we find a disastrous word. Depart from me. This passage may seem disconnected. It starts with God's command to go conquer the promised land. And then there is this passage about the tent of meeting, which, by the way, is not referring to the tabernacle. The tabernacle hasn't yet been built. They've just been given the instructions. And then there is this better known passage of Moses being covered in the cleft of the rock. But the dominant theme that ties all of these together is the surpassing worth of God's presence. And this is emphasized in the first of these two occurrences, the first of these two, uh, pa- these two parts of the passage by God's presence being absent. You see, God commands his people to go conquer Canaan. He says, depart, go up from here, you and the people whom you have brought up out of the land of Egypt to the land of which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And at first, this sounds very normal uh, for God to command this. Uh, this has actually been the plan for a while. They, they, they've only stopped at Sinai as a pit stop, it seems. It, you know, Exodus is, is a book about God keeping his promises, and, and the promises made 400 years ago to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob wasn't that they were just going to go and live in a wilderness of Sinai. They're going to go to a land flowing with milk and honey, a good land with good resources, a place of rest and fullness for life. And God already affirmed that this was the plan back in chapter 13, verse 5. The plan was never to stay at Sinai forever. But then God drops this bombshell. Verse 3, But I will not go up among you. This is, as it is described here by the Spirit's words, this is a disastrous word. And I would put to you that it is disastrous in at least two ways. The first is that Israel is by no means able to accomplish God's promises without him. Deuteronomy 7, 7 informs us that even with 600,000 men able to go to war, that they were still the fewest of all peoples on earth. They have until months prior, let me remind you, been slaves in Egypt, they've been laborers. They're, they're not warriors. Okay, they had that spat with the Amalekites, but that's because the Amalekites thought they were easy prey and would have, have annihilated them already if God had not intervened. And so how would they fare against six nations listed here? Canaanites, Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, nations which were stronger and mightier and had, by the way, the home turf advantage. This is a disastrous word first, because without God, great harm and destruction are certain. Dear friend, perhaps you know how disastrous this is. Perhaps you recall what life was like before you came to Christ, and you realized that you were living as a person without hope. You lived by the sword. You had no refuge, no solace in the midst of the many trials of this cursed life. And yet this is disastrous also in in an additional sense. And that's because God would be giving them exactly what they wanted. Recall what their sin has been. They made a golden calf. They said, make us gods who shall go before us. That's the language of, you know, we're we're sick and tired of waiting here at Sinai. We want to get going onto what's ahead of us, no matter what God may lead us. They wanted to get going to the promised land without the God who had promised it. Dear ones, that is exactly what many people are living this life like. They're chasing their dreams. They want to hit it big. They want one more rung up the ladder. They want, the, 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 they want a life of rest and ease. And if they're honest, they don't care that God gives that to them. They don't care about God who gives and withholds all of those things. Dear ones, God is, by this disastrous word, making us to stop and think. What would the best of this life be without him? To use an analogy, what what power hungry, hungry businessman will say at the end of his life that it was worth getting the merger, making the biggest sale ever, having the most pennies in the piggy bank if he betrayed his best friend who had supported him all the way in the process? Men such as these who console themselves by telling themselves it's it's lonely at the top when in reality they have only dug themselves to the bottom. So Jesus asked, what does it profit a man 
to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul. And yet you know as well as I do that men sell their souls every day. And perhaps you know the barrenness of the things you have sought after and how even, even those things that you obtained them, you got them, and they did not satisfy. God is drawing us to see that he alone will satisfy. That greater than all the gifts that he gives is the gift of himself. And so he called his people to humble themselves. Now, in ancient cultures, it was common practice to display what was going on inside of you, outside of you. If you were mourning, you literally wore sackcloth and you put ashes on your face. If you were fasting, you would tend to avoid washing and, and you wouldn't anoint your head with oil. That was the, the, the way thinking went back then. And so the people here humble themselves in a, in a, in a visible way. They took off their jewelry and their fine clothes. And we might remember where these slaves got those things. Uh, uh, where did they get these ornaments? They plundered the Egyptians, right? Well, right, and hold on a second. Almighty God had given them the gold and the silver and the riches. Everything they have is from God. And so therefore, to show that they did not delight in the gifts of God as much as in God himself, they stripped themselves of their finery. They dressed modestly. And this is a pattern which, which continues for us as Christians. It's not just an ancient people thing. There is an appropriateness to Christians dressing modestly if we are seeking God's attention and not the mere attentions of men or women. Peter tells wives, 1 Peter 3, 3 through 5, do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. Dear ones, whose, whose eye are you trying to catch? If all this talk about the golden calf, about the, the, the mercy that comes through a mediator, if this, is, if this is coming home to you, an appropriate response is, I'm going to put off those things. I'm going to seek God with modesty and humility. So we clothe ourselves with submission, humility, compassion, to show that our glory is not in the clothing we wear. Our glory is always, always has been in the God whom we serve. Now, following this disastrous word, there's a section concerning a distant worship, a distant worship far off from the camp. We read verse 7 of how Moses would set up a tent. Now, this seems to be in some ways a precursor to the tabernacle. Both, both are called the tent of meeting. We could look at 2942, see, see a reference there. You might ask, though, why have this tent at all? And why, why particularly would you mention it? Why would you bring it up now of all times? Well, again, the reality is that Israel's sin begs the question of if the tabernacle itself will ever be constructed at all. The question on our minds as we read of this great sin of the people is, will God ever dwell with his people? And apparently this tent prefigured the tabernacle. This is where he would manifest his presence, where verse 9, his pillar of cloud would descend and stand. And this is where uh, you would go to meet with or to speak with God through Moses. Now, of course, God dwells in heaven. Even, in the highest he even the highest heaven cannot contain him. Therefore, God was communicating in physical space a spiritual reality. And he brings it up here for this reason. He is asking and answering the question, is he with them or not? So the existence of this tent and all that we read of it here actually gives us a nuanced answer to that question. God is still manifesting his presence. Praise him. If one sought the Lord, verse 8, this is a tent you could still go to, but notice where it was. Verse 7, in fact, a few times it's repeated here, three times it's repeated, it was outside the camp. It was far off from the camp. 
What a contrast to where the, t- the tabernacle, which we know from the book of Numbers, where that was, that was to be in the place in regarding this nation. It was literally to be the center of the people of God. Three tribes were to be encamped on each of the north, the south, the east, and the west. The picture we get is that God is still manifesting his presence with this tent, but he's not at the center. He's still at a distance. God was showing spatially what we read of in Isaiah 59, verse 2. Your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you. Dear ones, this is what sin does. This is the reality of how seriously we should take sin, how seriously God takes sin. He is holy. And his holiness is lethal. Evil cannot dwell with him. All, all the people have sinned. And that was, this was not just a slip up, not just a mistake. We looked at it last week. But it, this was a pattern of sin. They are stiff necked. He said, verse 3, if he were among them, he would consume them. And yet this is where this tent of meeting is actually a sign of hope. Because God could have could have said, I'm never speaking to any of you. I'm not, I'm not talking to Moses anymore. But he sends down his pillar of cloud. Yes, it's outside the camp. Yes, it's going to take effort to, to, to notice it. And, and, and yet people do. It's close enough that everyone, verse 10, could rise up and worship him from his or her tent door. They were still looking on, even though it was outside, even though it was far away. They were looking at the glory of God. They were expectantly looking to God. This tent is holding forth that God had not abandoned his people. He was chastising them. He was calling them to humble themselves. He was maintaining some proper distance, but the glory of Israel had not departed. Beloved, are there times when you have cried out to God? Or you have asked him, why are you so distant from me? You have wondered if he is even there. Dear ones, sometimes he does hide his face. He sometimes makes us feel his distance, that we would seek him, that we would realize how it would be better even to be a doormat at the house of the Lord than to dwell in the tents of wickedness, to make us to to put aside our finery, to recognize he is our finery, and to to even if if we sense that he's distant, to, to look for him. To seek after him. So that was, that's what this passage is about. Seek him in the day where he may be found. Ask him and he will answer you. Knock at the door of heaven and wait upon him. And as we have seen last, last week, God does show mercy. He does so through his mediator, through our Lord Jesus Christ, prefigured here by Moses. And so having heard a disastrous word, a distant worship, let's consider now a distinction requested and granted. Verse 11, the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. And God demonstrates that the way that we, the people, receive mercy in this passage is through the one who has favor with God. Moses is God's chosen instrument to display in time and space the steadfast love that has eternally existed, not not just between God and Moses. This is showing forth that eternal friendship, that eternal camaraderie, that eternal fellowship between father and son. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. This language describes the father and the son as ever being face to face, the intimacy that is there, God with God, God the first person, with God the second person. And so Moses is a picture of that. He's showing forth Jesus. And this this is showing that the favor that, that is to be shown to the people has to be shown to the mediator. And that's how Moses pled, you know, 
Show them, if you have favor for me, show it to them. If you reject them, reject me in their stead. These are the glorious truths of Christ's work as mediator on our behalf. And we did look at that extensively this morning. It's that you, if, you, if you realize that you have been a covenant breaker, you are justly under God's wrath. There, you want this mediator. You want this one between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. If he will plead your cause, he will be heard. If there is mercy for you, it will be found in this one. And one detail that we did not consider this morning appears in verse 16. Here Moses is pleading for the people, but notice part of his argument. He says, for how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not in your going with us so that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth? Again, I and your people, he identifies with this people. He's treating them and himself as a group. You, you, God, would you deal with us together in the same way? If you have favor toward me, how will you display that? Indeed, how could you display that without going with us? God, how can you love us without being with us? How can you refrain from being with us? Dear words, dear, dear ones, consider these same words of Jesus. Jesus says to the Father, the love with which you have had for me from before the foundation of the world, show to them by being one with them. That's Jesus' high priestly prayer, John 17. And Moses goes on then to declare that this presence of God is what makes us distinct. You're going with us so that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth. Friends, this is what sets us apart. This is what makes Christians different. Not anything inherent in us, not our wealth or traditions. We we cannot, we dare not pride ourselves on our own morality or intelligence. Our, Our culture or our skin color or gender cannot be what makes us distinct as a people. What makes us distinct is our God. And that puts all those other things in the right place. It's it's God's got to be, God's got to be the treasure. God's got to be the center. And so this does then affect how we gather gather together, why we gather, gather together. We're not just coming here because we're all at the same stage of life. And some of us are are getting older. Some of us are, are young and we're having our first kids. Some of us are our kids ourselves. You know, that we've got all, all variety of different phases in life that we're going to, different jobs, different callings that God has given. What, what actually unites us as a people? It's not just that we're, we happen to be in the same social status. We're not just we're in a circle of friends. It's because God is in our midst. We gather because We would gather around his throne. We would gather to worship him. That is what unites us. And our greatest glory then is to be pardoned by him and owned by him. That he would take us as his inheritance. As it says in chapter 34, verse 9. So friends, do you see how this whole passage is about God's presence? How without God... It would be a disaster how God would have us seek his face, how God's presence in our midst is what makes us distinct. And I suspect that for many of us, we know these things. We know we need God's presence, and yet we content ourselves with small doses of his presence and power in our lives. And yet this is the place where Moses shows us how wondrous God's presence is. He says, show me your glory. Think about it, friends. This is a very odd question for Moses to be asking at this point in Exodus. Moses has stood before the burning bush. Moses has been on Mount Sinai in the glory cloud. 
This is where he's been, by the way, over the entire past month. And we're told in this passage, verse 11, that the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. And so why would he ask, please show me your glory? Well, I believe the reason that Moses asked this is that if you know God, It will do something to you. You will either cower in fear or revulsion. Or you will want him more and more. Either you will run from this God or he will be your greatest and highest treasure. Friend, if your heart has been renewed and you experience even a microcosm of the awe and majesty of God's presence, it will will make you want more. You want his fullness. And if he chastises you by hiding his face, you will beg, Lord, show me your glory. He was asking to see more of God, to know more of him. To experience him in a fuller way, even for all that Moses had of God, there was far more glory to God yet to be experienced. Far more glory beyond. So great and glorious is our God. You cannot exhaust his majesty, his awe, his beauty. And yet how often do you and I We satisfy ourselves with a teaspoon of God's glory. How often do we attempt to content ourselves with a shadow of his glory? Dear dear ones, God is more glorious than we know. He is so glorious that literally if you experienced him, you would be consumed. And as much as Moses is meant to show forth Jesus who is yet to come, he's not Jesus. Moses is sinful. He's like us. And so God says to him, you cannot see my face. No man shall see me and live. God is that holy. He is that glorious. And yet God does this. He lets Moses see his back even to see God's back is glorious. Even to see him manifest his glory in this minor way is breathtaking. Even to hear his name from his voice would move us to fall down to the earth and worship him because he is the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin who who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. God showed his glory to Moses but not in a full way. And yet this was a way of showing his glory in a way that showed there was more to be anticipated, more to long for. And yet, dear ones, some of that we know of and how often we, we, we don't even think about how glorious it is. Because God said, Matthew one twenty three, or the angel God sent said, Behold, The virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Or 2 Corinthians 4, 6, For God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. We have so much more glory than Moses had seen. And yet, do we, like Moses did, do we long for more? Do we recognize, do we really, has it, has it gotten to our, our, the pit of our stomachs how disastrous it would be if this God in all his glory, if he would depart from us? Do our hearts break over our sin when we discern that, that God is distant from, distant from us, that he has 
Sin makes a separation between us and this God and his glory. Do we recognize that the only one who can bridge that gap is the mediator he has sent who shows us that glory and its fullness, Jesus Christ? Do we then live in such a way that shows that that thing which sets us apart, which is our glory, is God himself, whom we know through his son, Jesus? Well, friends, this is, this is our glory. This is what sets us apart to this day. Jesus promised this. He said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to him. Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you. Always, even to the end of the age. Friends, this is the surpassing worth and glory of God with us. And it has come to us in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, forgive us for how often we have failed to see your glory. Forgive us where we so often have sought what is not glorious. Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for our king. Thank you for him who shows us, who in whose face we behold your glory in a way that Moses did not yet know. Lord, help us to long even for greater measures of your glory. Lord, give us humble hearts. uh, Give us a modesty that we would seek your eye. Lord, Give us hearts to to yearn for you, especially when we feel distant from you. For you keep your promises. You are faithful. You are this God. You are our God. And your son, Jesus Christ. We pray this in his name. Amen.